George Ross, Carter Braxton, Arthur Middleton, Stephen Hopkins, Josiah Bartlett. You know these men. You may not remember how you know these men, but you've seen their names. We live in a world today where leftists seem to have control over our lives. Many of us cower before them as we fully fear the power that they wield. With just a few keystrokes and the clicks of a mouse, the liberal intelligentsia can embarrass us, publicly slander and attempt to humiliate us. If we say the wrong thing in the eyes of the communist liberal Democrat tribe, they can respond in such a way to cause us to lose friends or family, bring embarrassment to us, and even cause us to lose our jobs. And they're wrong. They lie and they cheat, they misquote, but the damage can be done loss of reputation, and even our livelihood. Americans fear standing up for the truth. What they believe in, all of us are under risk of attack or loss. Back to those men, I only named five of them, but they were part of a group of 56 men whose names appear at the bottom of the declaration. Now we sometimes forget what actually occurred at that time. These men signed a document which, in essence, was a statement of rebellion and of insurrection against their government. Foolish people today accuse the great leaders of the Confederacy, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, etc., of treason. Well, if there ever were a treasonous lot, these 56 men were that. And if caught by the government, they risked not just embarrassment, no one would simply call their name out on social media, they risked the hangman's noose. If George, King of England, had a capital building in the colonies, these men would almost certainly have, without hesitation, protested in the same manner that the J6 protesters did. Do we actually think our ancestors, who dumped 342 chests of tea into the Boston Harbor, those people who in 1770 sacrificed the lives of nine patriots, or seditionists, depending on what side you were on, they were murdered, when they stood up to the British soldiers in what's now known as the Boston Massacre? If not for these men, we wouldn't have the country we have today that we watch daily being assaulted and attacked by the communist leftist hordes. These men risk their lives so that we can live in freedom. They risk their lives for us. So when our grandchildren read of this time and they see the attacks on our way of life, what will they think of us? the wanton disregard for the Constitution that some of these same men would be involved in creating, the corruption in our government, the stealing of elections, the deep state operating as a hidden government that exercises power alongside or within our elected federal government, the moral decay where our children are not only prohibited from praying or reading the Holy Word of God, the Bible, in schools, but are now being abused by adults speaking to them of sexual aberrations and parents being left out of the discussion. The attack on the family and especially marriage, which from the time of Adam and Eve was defined as one man and one woman and our society being inundated with immorality today. Pride Month where government and corporate entities not only tolerate but praise homosexuality, which God condemned. So. How are we gonna respond? Will we be as the people of North Korea, China, Cuba, and other places who allow our way of life to be destroyed and replaced by an authoritarian, godless regime? Or will we, as these 56 men did, stand tall, fearlessly, and without hesitation, fight the un-American forces that revel in the destruction of our culture and civilization? It is our decision. Join us in the fight. I'm Dan Meredith, and this is Heartland Liberty. Hello and welcome to Heartland Liberty. I'm Dan Meredith, your host. Thank you for being here. We have such interesting guests. Today we have someone that's come all the way from Washington State. I thought everybody that lived in Washington State on the left coast was crazy. <laughs> so you're maybe just half crazy. I'm because partially. You, you come to Tennessee to visit. That's right. So we're glad to have Mark Herr with us today. Mark is the president and a board member of a group called the Center for Self-Governance. Now, 
self-governance is supposed to be what America is all about. Right. But we've sort of left that, haven't we? Uh, we absolutely have left self-governance. Um, Thomas Jefferson said in the 1820s in a letter that uh, the habit and practice of self-governance is not innate and its qualifications require habit in long training and we've definitely given up the habit in long training. This country was built on that. Now I met you through a friend. Uh, you come to this area and have classes from time to time and it's just fascinating how we've forgotten the whole concept of self-governance but this the, uh, America was described as an experiment. This is something that hasn't really been done before to have a country that was built on the people governing the people. Yeah. But it seems like we've, we've gone away from that. We've got, we call them our leaders, but really they're supposed to be our representatives yes. and we're supposed to lead them. So what's happened? What's gone wrong? Well, it's a, it's a long process. We're, we're coming up on the 250th anniversary of America's birthday in 2026. And um, the definition of independence and self-governance and freedom, liberty, all of those cliches are, are, are being changed for the 21st century by people who um, uh, don't believe in those, either those ideals or the structure of government, and they have some other view of what the 21st century should look like. So along the way, we've, we've lost our way in, in many, many forms. Um, in the 1840s through the 1860s, a lot of uh, uh, struggle over slavery and economy and industrial revolution type things. Then of course we had a terrible civil war uh, that divided the nation and, and ultimately the, the South was forced to rejoin that union. But particularly after the civil war in 1865, the association movement was born. And in the birth of that association movement, and their, their cause was noble, noble, prevent slavery, prevent secession, and prevent the ascendancy of anyone who becomes elected who was pro-slavery. That year, Andrew Johnson from Tennessee, uh, who took over the presidency of the United States, uh, but his position was pro-slavery, although he was anti-secession. It's the reason he was in the administration in the first place. But the, the people in the North, particularly Connecticut and Massachusetts, were very upset that both South Carolina, that was still pro-slavery, Black Code, Jim Crow, lynching, segregation, all those things, w was forced to rejoin the Union, but in such a gentle way, is the way they saw it. And they were also very frustrated that Andrew Johnson, who was pro-slavery but anti-secession, could ascend to the presidency. So they met in October of 1865 and created the American Social Science Association. The purpose of that association was to prevent slavery, prevent secession like South Carolina, and prevent the ascendancy of people like Andrew Johnson from Tennessee who happened to be pro-slavery but was anti-secession. So they began to organize quite heavily from 1865 to 1867 and they convinced the radical Republicans in Congress to impeach Andrew Johnson. Mm -hmm. Now I, 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 know, I, know that, mm -hmm. I know that that's uh, very familiar to most of us. Uh, in our lifetimes, we've seen a recent president that was impeached twice, <clears throat> and in, in their case, it was they did not want somebody who they considered pro-slavery to be in charge of the United States of America. Right. Well, I, I agree. Our organization agrees 100%. However, the start of the 1900s, a shift came into the association movement, and they added a process of converting the United States of converting it from what we know as dual federalism or layer cake federalism, which is the original system. Mm -hmm. You separate the federal, you separate the states, you, you have a governor, you have mm -hmm. a legislature, you have all these divisions, separation of power, separation of governments. And a concerted effort was made to begin converting the United States of America into a new form of government. And this movement was started by a gentleman named Charles Merriam. And it was his intention to collapse our system, convert it into a new system, while adopting and advancing this pro-association movement's agenda of preventing slavery, preventing secession, preventing ascendancy of pro-slavery people, and adding this conversion to the United States called uh -huh. cooperative federalism. Okay. And so, to summarize, we are in the process of being converted through the association movement 
into a new form of government called cooperative federalism. And I know that's a lot to take, but yeah. you asked me, how, yeah. how did this happen and why are we changing? Yeah, Source. and th these are concepts that not many people have even heard that, that is, you're talking about. That is correct. There was a book written, <coughs> I just uh, briefly read through it a few years ago, a book written, uh, and I, I don't remember the author, but it was entitled uh, 1865, Freeing or Emancipating Slaves, Enslaving Free Men. That this is what happened at the end of the war, that there was interest in, in freeing slaves, but there was something that happened then. Yes. That there was a difference because before there was a, there was a concept, most people before thought that secession was uh, an under, understood as, I mean, there, was, there were states in the North that had tried to see, secede before, and they thought, well, it's okay. You know, mm -hmm. the rights in the Constitution that weren't uh, prohibited to the states were rights that the states had, and nothing in the Constitution said that you can't secede. And there were secession movements prior, and so there were uh, there was something that happened then that the uh, the slaves, even though the war didn't end slavery, slavery was still legal after the war. It took it took the amendment after the war that ended slavery, but that there was something that changed at that point. And that, I, I would argue that, that freedom the, of people was changed, that there was an, a consolidation of the federal government. Yes, and was, even beyond the federal government was this outside of the federal government, these um, uh, various groups like journalists, mm. uh, academics, uh, jurisprudence, attorneys right. and judges, and other charitable uh, 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 philanthropists that gathered together in Boston on October 4th, 1865, mm -hmm. specifically because they believed that this was their opportunity to make a shift uh, in, in the um, charitable perspective of how they deal dealt with mankind after the Civil War. So they used slavery, secession, and the ascendancy of Johnson as their excuse. And it seems like uh, this has almost been sort of an uh, an underground movement that that nobody really talked about it. You're you're talking about it now, and it seems like I don't know in the last six or eight years when people have talked about the deep state that now we're understanding that there there are powers out here that are in control. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I use the example that 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 there were uh, there the the cartoon. In the, in the past where we talked about, here's how laws are made. It goes right. to the Senate, it goes to the House, it goes to the President. Right. It's really not like that. There are some controls out here that are controlling, and we really don't have the power that we thought. That the laws aren't made like we think they are. There are some, some you, you might call it the deep state or whatever, there are some controls that are going on in our country that we're just now figuring out what's going on. And it's, it's really important to understand <clears throat> that we we try to provi we try to create labels in our discussion so we can describe what we're either intuitively experiencing, but to be very specific, the association movement um, influences your local, state, and federal elected appointed employees of government mm -hmm. through their through their membership. They draw the elected appointed employees of government into the association. I'm going to give an example here in just a second. Okay. And then they send them back to your locality, uh, back to the state of Tennessee, or, or let's say back to Davidson County, back to the state of Tennessee, or, or, or back into the federal government with governance training, liability protection, and cooperative federalism policies. And so because there's not an alternative, your elected, appointed, employed government officials, they're used to us showing up, screaming and yelling when we feel the pain. But m most of the time, they're by themselves, and the only interaction they're having are with these associations. And these associations are providing them with benefit. I'm not, and I, I'm, listen, I, our organization is definitely pro-layer cake, but we understand the cooperative marble cake system. We understand why it, it provides benefits. However, there's not a competitive counter-argument to the value. And so over time, through attrition, there is this tendency of um, that th they bring these policies back to your locality, back to your state. Next thing you know, you, you have school boards not listening to parents, or you have strange policies, and your representatives aren't listening to you anymore. They start referring to you as domestic terrorists, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Well, we just got a few seconds here, about 30 seconds. Let's uh, come back in a few minutes and let's talk about some practical ways that maybe we can have, we as normal citizens, maybe make some changes. Because it seems like, as you talked about, that there's, uh, there's uh, uh, the big business, there's the judiciary, there's the educational institutions. They seem like they're just sort of in control. And we're out here just sort of floating around like there's nothing we can do. So let's see if maybe we can talk about how we can get more in control and change some of these things. Absolutely. So, okay, we'll be right back. And we're glad you're here with us on Heartland Liberty. Our guest today is Mark Herr, president of the Center for Self-Governance. Thanks again for being here, Mark. Thanks for having me, Dan. We've talked about the way that our republic was set up and the way it's sort of shifted around 1865 after the war, as they say, as we say in the South. <laughs> Things have changed, and now we've got just a, a different type of government, and it's, it's almost like a dream sequence where from 1776 or 1789 to today, we think we've got this republic, as uh, Franklin said, if we can keep it, but we really haven't kept it. This is a different kind of thing. Uh, and I think it's sort of humorous how the people in Washington talk about, well, the founders said so-and-so, but then they go about their business just ignoring the founders, don't they? They do, um, and the, the reason goes back to the conversion from original system, the dual federal layer cake, to the current cooperative marble cake system. Um, and so you hear language like that white uh, male patriarchy, systemic racism, Donald Trump was a racist or is a racist, and uh, that we need to uh, burn down America, Black Lives Matter. I mean, all of this kind of language in our lifetime is kind of uh, the outgrowth of that movement of converting our system to this to this new form of government. So all these people that are saying these things, are they, are they right that what we have today just needs to be burned down? Or is there, is there hope? Can we actually get back to what we're supposed to be? Or is it lost? Well, it's, you know, and that, that's a great question because it's very easy to manipulate the governed. Um, you think about North Koreans, they think that Kim Jong-un is the government. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, uh, just prior to the 1776 Declaration of Independence, Abigail Adams wrote her husband a letter in which she said, the government of more stability is much wanted and the colonists are ready to receive them from the hands of Congress. Now she went back and she crossed out the word them and inserted the word it. And so I think in our lifetime, the critical piece is that we, uh, as as regular people, normal people living our day-to-day -day lives, it's very important that we start by thinking of government as a system rather than a person. So you, you think about Donald Trump, there are people who love Trump, people who hated Trump, and so they rallied around the quarterback or they hated the quarterback, and so you impeached the quarterback, I mean, all these things. Now you have Joe Biden, and so it's the same thing. There's people who hate Biden, there's people who love Biden. We are in danger as a culture of thinking of government as a person, and there's a consequence to that. We naturally, inevitably, if we don't change the way we think about government, will become enslaved like North Koreans, whether they were Democrat or Republican. So mm -hmm. I think that's the really the most important. So how first do step. we think? How should we think of government? Well, I don't want to tell people how they should think. What I would say is, is that <clears throat> in the real world, we don't think of the car and the driver as the same thing. Mm -hmm. We separate the driver from the car. And all I'm saying is, is that fundamentally in our culture, it would be helpful to our politics and how we engage one another at our dinner tables with our kids, our parents and our neighbors, that if we had a conversation about the system apart from the person, there's two different conversation opportunities. One is very divisive and leads us down a path of division, just like the Civil War. The other is a pathway that leads us down to a choice. And that is, do you and I agree that we want all the control to be concentrated in Joe Biden's hand or Donald Trump's hand for that matter? Or do we want the control to be diffused, separated into as many parts as possible so that you and I, whether I'm Democrat or Republican or not, or something otherwise, that we could have um, 
an opportunity to explore, innovate, create, mm -hmm. discover, prosper, fail, learn, all of those things that make America great in the first place. Why so many people want to come to this nation. I think it would be so helpful to our nation if we start at this point of changing our cultural paradigm that government is a system and not a person. You know, what I find, and sadly, is that a lot of people that want government to be diffuse and not not controlled in in one power they don't want the federal government to control until they want what they want and i see my conservative friends they say no states right states right. the states need to take until it's their thing right. except that marijuana thing yeah we need a federal law against that or marriage or whatever we need the feds to come in and make a law about this and so i used to tell people uh you know we don't want somebody carrying a big stick until it's our thing and then we want the feds to carry the big stick yes so that that's sort of something that we people don't want to agree on uh, until it's their thing we all want the federal government and to be strong when it's our thing and, yeah. and it's hard for people to, to get the concept down. When you get back to the layer cake concept, the founders said, no, you know, the, the states is where the power ought to be and the feds don't need to be controlling things. And I think today people, it's hard for them to agree on it is. all things. It, it is 100% They impossible. want a North, a North Korea government when it comes to their things. Exactly. And this is why we refer to ourselves as the Center for Self-Governance. We don't think in our organization that self-governance just means you do what you want, I'll do what I want, and there's a boundary between us. We believe that self-governance starts with governing myself first. Mm -hmm. And the first question I ask our students is, do you love others' liberty as much as your oh, personal yeah. influence? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. And ultimately it comes down to, again, we, we come back to the central theme, which is, can I see government's boundaries and controls and how that affects your liberty, not just my issue right. that I'm holding on to so right. tightly and I'm willing to become Kim Jong-un in order yeah. to make it so. Yeah. Whether I'm a Democrat or Republican, it's something that we can all come to the table to discuss, and I, th I think we're going to have that discussion in our lifetimes. And that's right. what I'm so excited about our organization. We're bringing that discussion back to the table. We're finding our students across the country, both Democrat and Republican, are able to sit down and say, we may not agree on gay or gun or marijuana or whatever the issue. There's thousands, right? But we can have a discussion about, do we want control to be diffused or concentrated? Mm -hmm. And maybe different issues require more control, and maybe more issues require diffused controls. Mm -hmm. If we can have that discussion, Dan, in yeah. our culture in the 21st century, imagine what it'll look like for kids yeah. in the next 50, yeah. 60 years. Yeah. So tell me about the Center for Self-Government. I've got a uh, paper here, CSG Training 2021. It looks like you've got interesting state constitution study programs. So you all teach classes on the Tennessee Constitution. We do. The, the Vermont Constitution, I wouldn't care about that, but the California <laughs> Constitution, uh, you know, so you teach them on state constitution, <laughs> systemic politics, uh, uh, so many different things. Tell me about, if someone wants to take classes, how they would get a, a hold of y'all, we've got three minutes left, uh, and, and what they can learn if they take classes with y'all. So is it in person or online, or how can they learn? All that stuff. So centerforselfgovernance.com is the easiest way to figure out what kind of needs each community has. There's, there's 3,084 counties in the United States, about 35,000 towns and cities, and about 16,000 school districts. And so all are unique because our nation is a diverse culture of people and so the needs are a little bit different so what we've done is we've taken the partisan out and we've put the system in mm -hmm. we teach the structure of government classes so if you want to learn about the school we teach the structure of school government in your community how is it designed in california is not the same way that it's designed in tennessee we teach city county regional state and federal structure of government we just use the constitution the federal or the state laws okay. and we show them the boundaries and controls of that structure if they want to go further 
We have a leadership in systematic politics training, which helps expose them to people like Charles Miriam and the association movement. That's a more intensive training, but it helps develop leaders. So we now have over 300 of our students across the nation that are now elected from school all the way to state legislators. Even in this state of Tennessee, there are Center for Self-Governance students been through our training that are now elected. Um, and we have students that d decide not never to get elected, but behind the scenes, they're great leaders, uh, driving influence and making change positively. Um, so the philosophy that you all teach is, we don't sit back and be governed. We participate. Yes. And, and teach those who govern us how they should be governing us. I think the way I say it in the class is it's like a pilot and a passenger. Mm -hmm. The passengers don't like the direction of the plane, and they hate the people on the left side of the aisle, so they'll have a big ass food fight, excuse mm -hmm. my language. Yeah. But then they'll storm the cockpit, they'll storm the cockpit, and they'll, they'll try to take over the direction of the plane. And then from there, um, they don't realize that the plane is being you know, sabotaged or crashed. So we train mechanics. Okay. And that conversation is so distinct from a passenger conversation with a pilot. Banging on the cockpit door, turn the plane to the right, turn to the plane to the right, versus a mechanic who can have a conversation with the passengers and a conversation with the pilots. Okay, okay, well that's great. Uh, you all do some great work. Uh, the, uh, we've got one minute left, 30 seconds left. Where do people go to find out more about your group? Centerforselfgovernance.com is the best place to start. We're on every social media and alternative media platform there is. Centerforselfgovernance.com. Not government, but governance, G-O-V-E-R-N-A-N-C-E. Dot com. A in spelling. Centerforselfgovernance.com. You're Mark Her, H-E-R-R. And we're glad you're here. Long trip from Washington State. And uh, glad you're here and just, just, just tickled to death about the work that you all are doing. I love the state of Thank Tennessee. You Thank you, Dan. And we're going to do a second show with you about government overreach and a lot of things that are happening in the government. So stay tuned. Come and see Mark again on our second show when we talk about this deep state, you want to call it, or the movements that are away from the true founders type of government and what we see today. Thank you for being here. This is Heartland Liberty and I'm Dan Meredith.